Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Here we are at the Hall of Heavy Metal History with the one and only Mr. Johnny Zazula. Of course, Marsha is with you, but she's not here right now, but we are live and we're on video. So I just want to give everybody a quick little teaser that you will be inducted into the Hall of Heavy Metal History. And what was your first thoughts when uh, Pat uh, Gisualdo told you this? Well, Muncie Ritchie actually called me up prior to Pat and told me I was inducted. I, I thought he told me I just got indicted. <laughs> I didn't know what happened to me. I thought I was going away for something I didn't know. And then he told me, will you go and receive an award for being a good boy and for being a good girl to Marsha and doing what you had to do for metal. So he said, okay. And here we, here we are, man. Here we are. The, the book. The and, book. And, and, and you know, you told me about this book. Uh, there's a book coming out, your autobiography, I guess. Memoirs. Your memoirs. Memoir. Just tell me about the overall, uh, we'll call it the overall topic of this book. Of wh wh what's this book about? Well, it's, the, the book is coming out in October, I hope. I hope by Halloween of this year. It is finished. We're just filling in a few little uh, parts. I'm trying to finished my thank you list, which is already four chapters long. And to make the story short, the book starts where most people wanted to end the book, at the Roseland Ballroom, when Anthrax, Metallica, and Raven played, and all three bands got signed to major labels that night. They thought that's where the pinnacle of the story lies. But to tell you the truth, the book opens up on that. Wow, that's cool. And goes from there. So it really starts you with the madness of the Roseland Ballroom. I forgot what year it was, I think 83, 84. And it goes from the Roseland Ballroom to today. And uh, today is, this is what we're doing today. We're sitting here talking today. <laughs> when you look, when, you, when you're doing this memoir, a lot of times it opens up memories that you completely forgot about. Did, did it do that? And, and I've spoken to a lot of artists who did write memoirs and they go, oh my God, it, another memory and another memory and another memory. I can't believe I did that. Well, what's going to happen when someone reads this book, which by the way, I believe it'll be the kind of book you pick up and put down in one reading. It just reads really fast. At least two readings the most. I love that, the sound of the bass behind me. It's my heart beating. All right, so anyway, um, I forgot what the question was, to be honest the with question you. Is, the question is, when you're writing a memoir, it opens up new memories that you oh, forgot the memories. About. Yeah. Well, I forgot about everything. <laughs> I didn't remember. That's memoir, right? <laughs> I brought in a fellow named Harold Claros, who researched my life in and out and laid it all out for me. We both, after chapters five or six, looked at each other and said, all that happened in a year and a half. All that happened in two years. I mean, we went from total obscurity in a flea market, making, you know, fifty dollars uh, a night, to at one point being worth over ten million dollars. It's a great story, and it's and it's a great story about a husband and a wife, how they work together through thick and thin. And the book talks about the problems and how we started with not a dime, without a pot to piss and living in a hole for years. Very interesting story, if I must say my, so myself. And it's a blue collar story. It's not about somebody who was born with a silver spoon and had to make it. I mean, we really had to bust our asses. You know, I pushed garments in the garment district when I was a kid yeah. and boxes on my back to, to shippers. You know, this is, uh, that's the guy. You know, and the wife he met him together, they they made something. And that's what this book's going to be about. That's cool. Yeah. What, what were your thoughts when, when Scott Ian handed you uh, his first demo tape that, you know, he claims that you just didn't want anything to do with them? I didn't want anything to do with Scott Ian and Anthrax. 
I hated those guys. They were pains in my ass, man. Literally. And Scott and Spitz and Luca and Turban, they chased me and Marsha from here to hell trying to get us to listen to their music, and we did. We listened to every note they ever gave us, and we listened very hard. We really wanted to love it, but we didn't. We were having problems both at that time with tapes from Overkill and Anthrax. They were both so close, but they didn't quite hit it. And it wasn't until Scott came to us with his single, Soldiers of Metal demo for Soldiers of Metal Howling Furies that we said now that sounds great could we get an album of those yeah. and uh, it was called Kennedy and the band who delivered Fistful of Metal and the rest is history yeah okay now you look back Metallica probably one of the biggest bands in the world mm. how does it make you feel that you were you discovered these guys. You were the guy who, who risked it all to make this band happen. I mean, or maybe you're very humble about it, and it's like, yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. You know, I don't believe, and Marsha doesn't believe that we're the people who actually did it sometimes. You know, they're so big and huge, and we speak to them, and they talk to us, and we talk to each other every six months, like clockwork. And the reality of life is, that uh, we don't really feel the magnitude of the whole thing. Okay. We, you know, we don't. It's surreal, is that it? Surreal, is it? Yeah. Like, I don't believe I'm here right now to get an award. I, I think it's hilarious. It, it, it's, it's interesting because as a kid, the albums that you help get out there were the ones that got me into metal so it's kind of I'm sitting next to the guy who actually made it happen you remember a store store called rock on stock in, rock in Montreal stock in Montreal yeah, yeah. That, Michelle yeah I didn't like him at all <laughs> no I, I took him to court and de destroyed him okay. he was a terrible terrible wicked man thief real nasty man and I don't say that about very many people but he was not a very good to uh, anthrax in particular one thing i've always wanted to know did you ever did you have a hand in helping uh metallica dismiss dave mustaine at the time look i had no hand in that uh they had come to me and used me as a feeding board but they did this all on themselves for me to take any credit or blame for that move would be wrong. I have had, I have gone on the record many times that that was a Metallica move in the in the store in house move. In terms of Exciter, the band Exciter came from Canada. Yes. What do you think they could have done? And they did they did well, but they they didn't really go to the next level. What do you think they could have done well, different? You have to understand that I didn't get along well with some of the members of the band. And whether it was ego, whether they thought I was a fool, whatever it was, they didn't give me the trust I needed. And in the studio, I don't think I gave them the trust or I gave them the trust they needed. I really didn't hear Violence and Force as the album that I wanted it to be for them to really break. They know that and we argued about it in the studio. And uh, I don't remember what happened, because my memory isn't good. But I know that we did not become friends through the years like we did with the other bands. What, what would you have changed different from all the bands that you've, you know, helped and develop and produce over the years? I would do nothing. I would do nothing that I would talk about here in this interview. Um, all I know is that I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And I made a lot of brilliant moves in my life. And I'm very glad the brilliant moves outweighed the mistakes so much. It's sort of like being a baseball player. You know, if you hit 400, you're doing really great. Yeah. You know, uh, I think we broke 500. Yeah, you know, I think so too. 
So we did good, and also we provided the soundtrack for a lot of people's lives. Yeah, including mine. Exactly. We've, we've done that. I saw some of your questions. They're really funny, but you're lucky you didn't ask. <laughs> Uh, well, anyways, I, 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 what we're going to do is this. We're, this is part one of our interview. All right. That's cool. And before your book comes out, we'll do part two. We'll do it on the phone, right? Uh, or by Skype or however you want to do it. We'll do it any way you want. All right. Any way you want to so do it. Johnny Zazula, uh, I guess the godfather, we'll call you the godfather of thrash, hard rock, and metal. Uh, thank you very much for the interview. Hey, nice talking to you, Jim. It was a pleasure.